Welcome to Building the Future, Freedom, Prosperity, and Foreign Policy, a podcast series focused on updating the United States soft power playbook to meet the hopes and aspirations of developing countries because it's in America's interest to do so. I'm Dan Rundy, Senior Vice President at CSIS. There are a lot of global challenges out there, so let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Building the Future. I'm Noam Unger, the Director of the Sustainable Development and Resilience Initiative, and a Senior Fellow with the Project on Prosperity and Development here at CSIS. I'll be your guest host today, filling in for Dan Rundy. I'm fortunate to be joined by our guests, Sarah Bermeo and Carrie Lynn Shule, co-directors of the Duke Program on Climate-Related Migration. Sarah is a political economist and associate professor of public policy and political science at the Sanford School at Duke University. Her research on international relations and development focuses on foreign aid, migration, climate change, and the intersection of these areas, particularly regarding climate change adaptation and the development of institutions for global public goods. In 2018, she released her book, Targeted Development, Industrialized Country Strategy in a Globalizing World with Oxford University Press. Welcome, Sarah. Great to be here. And Carrie Lynn Shule is a lecturing fellow at the Duke Center for International Development and a senior researcher at the International Migration Institute. Her research examines the root causes of human migration and immobility with an emphasis on the themes of gender, youth, education, rural development, and climate change. She has carried out extensive qualitative and mixed methods fieldwork in Ethiopia. Her book, Moved by Modernity, How Development Shapes Migration in Rural Ethiopia, is forthcoming also from Oxford University Press. Carrie Lynn, welcome. Thanks, Noam. So I'm hosting Sarah and Carrie Lynn on the podcast today to talk about climate migration and the lack of climate adaptation funding, uh, especially in rural areas. And we'll get into why we're looking at that specific problem. But first, just to begin, Carrie Lynn, could you explain what the Duke Program on Climate-Related Migration does? Sure. The Duke Program on Climate-Related Migration is a cross-disciplinary platform. It brings together researchers, practitioners, policymakers to better understand the relationship between climate change and human mobility and to better plan for the challenges and also the opportunities of climate-related migration. Our work is part of the Duke Climate Commitment and is funded by the Duke Office of Global Affairs. We think a lot about how to improve the ability of people to adapt in place where possible, uh, about how to increase opportunities to move with dignity when needed and desired, and how to enhance the resilience of destination communities. So we do this by building transdisciplinary networks of researchers and by trying to foster rigorous multi-method research. We also organize public engagement events, student learning opportunities regularly throughout the year. How long has it been in existence? We launched in November of 2022. Is that right, Sarah? That's right. Wow. And Sarah, I mean, clearly climate change is playing a bigger and bigger role in migration. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So it's really interesting. As um, Carrie Lynn mentioned, we launched in 2022. The previous year, the United States under the Biden administration put out a White House level report on the links between climate change and migration, really focusing on the geopolitical, economic and security dynamics of this nexus of climate change and migration. So it's starting to get some notice at the highest policy level. So there, I would argue maybe there hasn't been much movement, even though it's getting the, the notice, but maybe not a lot of policy, real policy response. And I think we can think about two kind of broad categories through which climate change intersects with human mobility or two, or two kind of outcomes that come from that. One is that you have climate change acting as a threat multiplier. So in places where people might have already been considering migration or thinking that that might be the only option available to them, if anything else happens, climate change comes along and it's the anything else that happens. It, it kind of tips people over and intersects. I like to say, though, I, I think this is might be becoming slightly less true, that people, you know, especially if we think about rural areas, people may leave their farms because of climate change, but they leave their countries for another reason. Because a lot of climate migration is internal. If something happens to you where you live, you move to some 
someplace else in your country. But if there are other drivers of migration within your country, if there's lack of economic opportunity, if there's violence and climate change causes you to need to leave your home, you may not have suitable areas to relocate within your country. And that's leading to the international aspects of migration that we're seeing. Where Carrie Lynn does a lot of her work, and she'll talk about this, I'm sure, a little bit later on, you have this other dynamic of the intersection of climate change and human mobility, which is that people can become trapped Climate change creates such a difficult financial and personal situation that they no longer have the resources to be able to move. And so you have these kind of two areas where we can see this impact of climate change on human mobility. One is, in some cases, increasing the amount of mobility that we're seeing because it's interacting with these other drivers. And other instances, we may see it actually decreasing human mobility and leaving people trapped in very unfortunate situations because they lack the ability to move. And I noticed that when I was introducing Carrie Lynn in terms of the focus on migration and also immobility. And so that's what you're meaning there, Sarah, when you're talking about that. I have another question, which is migration itself can be viewed as an adaptation measure. And there are other things that people can do that are considered adaptive to issues of climate change. And I imagine that's especially true in cases where they're immobile as well. But broadly, for our listeners, there's often a lot of confusion when we talk about adaptation funding. Could you talk about what adaptation funding means to you in terms of the context of climate change? When we're talking about foreign aid and adaptation funding in that context, there's really two buckets that climate-related foreign aid falls into, aid for climate change mitigation and aid for climate change adaptation. And so mitigation is helping communities or countries adopt technologies that will lead to less climate change overall. And so donor countries actually really favor this type of climate aid, because if you can mitigate, if you can stop or lessen the emissions of greenhouse gases, you're going to help the planet all over the place, no matter where you do that. What we mean by climate adaptation funding is helping people to adapt to the actual changes they're experiencing related to climate change. And many of these are happening already. Some of these are projected to be future changes, but actually saying, okay, no matter what we do on climate change, some changes to people's lives and livelihoods are already occurring and are projected to continue occurring, even if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today. Some changes are already baked in. And climate adaptation assistance is meant to help people realize, okay, we're living in a different world now. We are experiencing these impacts from climate change. How do we adapt to them? How do we find new ways to live our lives that allow us to deal with the new situation that we find ourselves in? And so that's what's meant by climate adaptation funding. If we want to look at you know a few really quick numbers on this, um, in 2019, so way back in 2009 at the Copenhagen Accords, which was part of these international climate agreements, wealthy country, you know, do aid donor countries agreed to supply $100 billion of new and additional climate finance by the year 2020. In 2019, the year before COVID, so that we kind of look at 2019 instead of 2020, they had reached about $80 billion, so they didn't reach that $100 billion billion dollars in climate adaptation or climate finance assistance and only about 14% of that 80 billion is for adaptation. The vast majority of it goes to mitigation. And this actually leads to some tensions between the donor countries and the um, developing countries, the recipient countries of foreign aid, because they're saying, we're feeling this now. We need more of this money dedicated to adaptation assistance. The UN estimates that we'll need $300 billion of aid annually for climate adaptation by 2030. And right now we're getting 14% right. of 80 billion. So there's a big gap between what is forecast as a need and what is actually being provided. The UN Environmental Program projects these sort of large numbers based in different ways, whether it's on modeling or country designated needs. And those numbers are huge in terms of the financing required. And I believe right now, we're getting close to the goal of 40 billion annually globally in terms of assistance on adaptation. So there's clearly a big gap. The, the ways that the funding seems to be oriented seems to be across a number of different areas. And people often seem to talk about in terms of food and food systems or ag systems, in terms of water, in terms of health, but also in terms of infrastructure. 
And what I'm finding more and more in our work here at CSIS is that this connects to all different parts of sort of the global economy and business investments and interests. I'm interested in, in particular, there's quite a bit of work being done on climate information systems and weather data. And Carrie Lynn, I was wondering if you could say more about just the lack of data and forecasts generally that are connected to climate and migration or climate-related migration, because I imagine that's quite an issue that you run into. Absolutely. We actually recently collaborated with USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, to look precisely at this issue, at the question of how good is our the forecasting models that we're using to predict climate-related migration. And I think USAID wanted to know, what should we do with some of these numbers we see coming out? How much should it inform our programming in different countries? And so we did a review of uh, different climate-related migration forecasting models. We talked with a number of modeling experts. And we noticed that really modeling in this particular space with this goal of forecasting climate migration has really grown in uh, number and sophistication since the 2010s. It's an area of interest. But one clear takeaway is that forecasting is still very much in its infancy. We aren't yet able to predict how many climate migrants there will be. And so when you do see these numbers swirling around the headlines, you should be quite skeptical about them. And I think, you know, a second main takeaway was really that one of the greatest challenges to modeling is that we don't have reliable data on migration, particularly in those countries that are the most vulnerable to climate change impacts. So, for example, modelers will often use what we call migrant stock data. This is different from migrant flow data, which is measuring the number of people coming and going. Migrant stock data is looking at how many, for example, international migrants live in a certain country at a certain time. It's usually collected with the census. And we use the stock data to estimate volumes of international migration, changes in international migration. This is sort of the foundation of the IOM's World Migration Report. But to give one example, 43% of countries in Central and South Asia, 16% of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, don't have at least one data source on international migrant stocks since the census rounds in 2010. So when we don't have up-to-date or accurate migration data, it's very hard to model, let alone forecast migration trends. But there's another challenge too that came out of this, and that's really what kind of migration are we modeling? So when we say climate-related migration, different people might have a different image that comes to mind when they think about what that migration looks like. So clearly, there are some cases where we think about displacement, the displacement that might follow a natural disaster, a sudden onset climate event like a tropical storm or a hurricane or floods. You might think of the 8 million people who were displaced by the floods in Pakistan in 2022. But this kind of movement actually has very different dynamics than other forms of migration. So displacement that follows natural disasters, it's it tends to be short term. There tend to be higher rates of return. There's a whole world of research around sort of patterns of displacement that follow natural disasters. Now, there's a very different kind of migration dynamic that happens in places that are experiencing more slow onset climate changes. So changes in temperature and rainfall patterns. In these instances, these kinds of environmental changes more gradually impact the political, economic, or social realities of a place, which then in turn affect how and where people migrate. In these instances, the effects of climate change on migration are more indirect, and it's much harder to disentangle climate impacts from other political drivers or economic drivers of migration. And this is really the challenge before development planners and policymakers is this wide spectrum of future climate-related mobility and immobility, like Sarah mentioned earlier, and and how to really plan for that. And so I think modeling that zooms in to particular regions or particular types of migration that it's trying to forecast can give us more accurate projections. And I imagine that what you just described is complex enough, but on top of it, sometimes it's the very same places and regions that are hit from a rapid onset, you know, natural hazard associated with climate change that are causing displacement and the sort of slower onset 
pressures that lead to perhaps political disruption, instability, drought, other things. that, And it's hard to disentangle those things uh, Absolutely. at the same time. You were talking about looking at specific regions. It strikes me that even, Sarah, when you were starting to describe this work, or Carrie Lynn, when you were starting to describe it, you're looking at both climate and migration, each of which in their own right is a huge political hot button issue. And you're looking at them together. And when we look at it from the United States, there's a lot of attention focused on the U.S. southern border and on Central America and the Northern Triangle in particular. Sarah, I know that you've written policy briefs related to Guatemala and Honduras. Could you talk a little bit about the regional implications of climate-related migration in Central America? I'm happy to. One thing that I hope, one message that I think I hope listeners get, whether it's from this podcast or somewhere else, what we are witnessing right now related to climate change in Central America is a mass exodus from rural areas of Central America that have been hit by repeated droughts from 2015 on. When we had examined some data, again, leading up to the start of COVID, because COVID starts to complicate things for how data were recorded at the southern border, but when we looked at data up through 2019, when we look at some of the subnational areas in, so what we would call states, what they call in Central America departments, the subnational areas within Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, we see that the more rural areas and the areas that were experiencing agricultural stress sent huge numbers of people to the U.S. southern border. In some of these states between 2012 and 2019, more than 7 percent of the population of the state within these countries showed up at the U.S. southern border as part of a family unit with children. This is also a huge demographic shift in the type of migration we've seen from Central America. Up until 2012, the majority of migrants coming from Central America were single adults, and they followed a pattern. They came to the United States, they looked for work, they sent money back home, but their families stayed where they were. What we have seen now in recent years is families coming together. And there's often a misconception in the media and in policy that maybe the reason people started showing up with their children at the southern border was because the, that made it easier for them to get in. If you bring your kids, it's easier to cross the border. But the kind of the counter argument to that is we do not see the same pattern with Mexico. With Mexico, you still see migration from Mexico is primarily single adults coming over the border where we're seeing families coming, people coming with their children, it's because they're coming from agricultural areas where it's become impossible to feed their children. Even before the droughts, some of these villages, particularly indigenous villages in the Guatemalan highlands, over 70% of the children were malnourished, you know, un under the age of five, even before the droughts hit. And then you layer droughts on top of that. And you're talking about countries that are some of the most violent in terms of homicides per capita in the world. It's not very easy to move to the cities and there aren't job opportunities in the cities and there's no food in the countryside. People no longer think I can just go to the United States and earn money and send it back. There's no food to, if there's no food to buy, if all the crops have failed, how do you send money back? And so we really are looking at a rural exodus from Central America that is related to climate change through this increase in frequency and intensity of droughts that are occurring in the region. The distinction between what you're seeing in the data that you're looking at between Mexico and migrants from Mexico and migrants from the Northern Triangle is interesting. And I'm wondering if the climate impacts data vary for those areas or if it's more of a governance distinction across the borders, because it's not like when you step across the border from Guatemala into Mexico, you're suddenly stepping into a different climatic context. But at some point, it does change. Our hypothesis on this, though it, it would require, Carrie Lynn was just mentioning how bad the data are, it would require some, some more data from some more places in order to really test this. But our hypothesis on this is that in a country the size of Mexico, similar to other countries that are experiencing big climate change like Bangladesh, the, both the land mass and the population are so much larger than what we're seeing in Central America that there are internal options for migration. The economy can absorb internal migrants. There are places within Mexico that when the southern part of Mexico that was in that dry corridor that was really experiencing drought 
when they were affected, people could move within Mexico. They, you know, they could move their families within the country. They didn't need to take them over borders. The Central American countries are small, both in terms of economic size and in terms of land mass. There's really not many places you can go in those countries and escape whatever the climate circumstance is that you're experiencing. I would say one thing that gives me pause when I look at data coming out of Mexico these days is the water crisis in Mexico is becoming much more severe and much more widespread than it was during the time period that we were looking at, at these data. And if it does become harder and harder to find internal migration options within Mexico, then I think you may start to see families, more families arriving rather than single adults. And that is something that I think U.S. policymakers should be paying attention to. Thank you. And Carrie Lynn, I know your research has looked at Ethiopia. Have you seen similar patterns in the data that you're looking at there? Or how do you characterize your findings from your research in Ethiopia? Sure. I think there's really interesting research coming out of the African context, which is looking at how do people move in response to changes in temperature and rainfall and generally what we're finding is there's not really one clear response. In one country, people move less. In another country, people are moving more. In a third country, there's no you know, significant relationship. And so for a lot of migration researchers, the question is then, okay, how do we then explain that? What, what's sort of this mediating context that determines how a climate impact eventually leads to more or less migration? And I think what I've seen in my research in Ethiopia that definitely applies beyond that country is that environmental shocks and stresses and whatever form that might come can actually reduce migration, particularly for the poorest populations. So in low-income countries like Ethiopia, in countries where the majority of the population lives in rural areas, is engaged in smallholder farming, in these contexts, migration is also part of the development process. So people will move from rural areas to towns and cities, sometimes abroad, but more often they move internally for education, to pursue different kinds of work, to pursue other life aspirations. This kind of rural urban migration is just part and parcel of development as we know it today. And so when severe drought strikes, in my field work, I saw that, well, families couldn't afford to send their children to town for school that year. People couldn't afford the bride price to get married. Plans to start a business had to be put on hold. And in this context, it wasn't really climate-related migration that was the development challenge. Actually, in rural Ethiopia, the people who continued to migrate were often from more advantaged backgrounds and were moving for other reasons. In this context, the real worrisome reality was climate-related immobility, if you will. So earlier, you mentioned this idea of migration as adaptation. And I think that's something that people are really interested in better understanding how to facilitate that. So this idea of migration as adaptation is the idea that migration can be a proactive response to climate impacts that can improve migrants' resilience by enabling them to access other sources of income. So if you think about a rural household, if one member migrates, well, this diversifies the income that they have available to them. It reduces the risk um, that might be associated with an environmental shock like a drought. And the implication is that for policymakers, for governments, facilitating migration, increasing access to migration as adaptation is one way that we can help families adapt to environmental changes and to also continue to contribute to their country's development. So I think this is a, is a key challenge, but many African countries and governments are aware of that and are actively beginning to incorporate migration into national adaptation planning. And I think this is a step in the right direction. The work that you're describing, both of you, is super interesting, and you've also done uh, briefs for the U.S. government on these issues. And, you know, as somebody who has been a participant and decision maker and watcher of U.S. foreign assistance for my entire career, I'm interested in your take on how you see these issues connecting or not connecting to U.S. foreign assistance and the role that agencies like USAID, where I used to work, can play or are playing. Sarah, what's your take on that? 
I think that the U.S. government is missing a lot of very low-hanging fruit in terms of responding to migration from Central America by not reallocating foreign aid. And so there's actually the last over the last several years, lots of foreign aid is going to Central America. I don't know if it's the right amount. That's a hard that's kind of a political question as well to ask. But eight percent or less of that is going to rural areas or is going to agriculture. So 8% of or less of U.S. foreign aid in a given year to Central America is going to agriculture. And yet the majority of migrants showing up, especially as part of family units, which are the largest numbers of migrants from the Northern Triangle countries right now. And keeping in mind, Guatemala and Honduras are the third and fourth largest senders of migrants to the United States. Um, you know, last year, we look at like 2023. So these are huge senders of migrants to the United States. The majority of migrants are coming from rural areas. By far, the majority of children as part of migrant families are coming from rural areas. They're coming from agricultural backgrounds, and less than 8% of U.S. foreign aid is targeting agriculture, which is a huge missed opportunity, especially when we think about the other drivers of migration from Central America. It is really hard to change gang violence. It is really hard to break up drug cartels, right? Those are some of the other things that are driving. We've been really bad as the United States at stopping weapons trafficking down into these countries from our southern border. These are hard things to do. You know what's politically easy to do? Give money to smallholder farmers. I have done talks in Arkansas and people just get it. Like, well, of course, that, like, of course, if they're experiencing drought, they're like, we're farmers. We understand that. If it doesn't rain, your food doesn't grow. Like, people just get it. This is a political, easy win that would help people who want to stay. That's the other key thing. Most of these people do not want to leave. They have been on these lands. Their families have been on these lands, in some cases, hundreds of years. They want to stay where they are. Up until the droughts, they did stay where they were. These families, when Honduras was the murder capital of the world, when El Salvador was the murder capital of the world, these families were not bringing their children to the United States. What's driving them to bring their children to the United States is drought. And there are programs in Central America right now. I teamed up with a group working with Catholic Relief Services. They are... They're making a difference with smallholder farmers on the ground. They're increasing yields. They're increasing soil quality. Let's talk about that because I, I yeah. want the, it's not just about pushing money towards rural agricultural areas. Presumably, it's also about actually making a difference in the ability of people who live in those areas to improve their own livelihoods and to take up certain measures, learn certain approaches, innovate in certain ways to have better soils, crop diversification, or whatever it is. Is that sort of in line with what you're talking about? Yeah, I think one of the real like eye-openers for me looking in this region is how many already known practices, like practices that people just know work on farms. So things like not doing too much tillage on the land, which dries it out, planting cover crops to retain moisture and get nutrients, not burning crop stubble, which is you know terrible for the land. These are like very low cost, or in some cases, maybe even no cost interventions that are not being adopted wide scale in Central America. And there are, I spoke one, at one point with an NGO in the region who was doing, that was doing work, but it was being financed by a foundation, not by the U.S. government. And I said, if U.S., and, but they were making a huge difference in terms of increasing yields of crops for the people, even during the drought, even during the 2018 drought. I said, well, could you scale this? And they're like, of course we could scale it. We just don't have the funding. And those are the big missed opportunities because these are programs on the ground. They have demonstrated impact with the exact populations where we're seeing huge levels of family migration. And yet the money is just not flowing there. So I'd like to ask both of you, where you see this kind of research, how you see this research evolving over the coming years. Because as you said at the beginning, this is not a set of issues that's going away. This is a set of issues that is growing. And even if we are successful against our highly ambitious mitigation targets, even if we're successful against those targets, we are talking about increasing severity and frequency of storms and lots of different types of climate impacts on more than 3 billion people living in the most vulnerable places around the world. And that's principally in countries across the global south, 
who bear the least responsibility for climate change in the first place. So this is a growing issue. It's growing on the agenda. But where do you see the research around this nexus of climate and migration going in the coming years? What would you like to see change in terms of availability of data or support around this agenda? Because the work that you're doing is so incredibly important, and I think it's only going to be more and more in demand. Carrie Lynn, let's start with you. Thanks. Climate change and migration are two of the the twin challenges of our time. And like you said, to address them requires, you know, there's no easy solution. You can't just tweak something here or there. These are reflective of how we are organizing our societies, um, the challenges that we, these intractable challenges that we face. So I think where I would like to see the conversation moving with climate change and migration and specifically climate related migration is to think not just about the challenges that come with population movements, but also the opportunities. And this is something that, you know, really is specific to my work in the African context, but more broadly and embracing this idea of migration as adaptation, I think is really fundamental. But I would add that I think we're not paying enough attention to the people who aren't moving. And we tend to assume that those who aren't moving might be trapped. This is a huge humanitarian concern. This is something we need to pay a lot of attention to. The poorest of the poor lack the ability to move. And so that's one major issue we need to pay attention to. But a lot of my own work is going in the direction of what we call voluntary immobility. It's people who are actually refusing to leave, people who feel a strong sense of attachment or commitment to place. We see this a lot with different indigenous communities around the world in the Pacific Islands, people who are refusing to leave as their best adaptation strategy, but really are demanding for investments to be able to adapt in place and see this very much as a climate justice issue to receive those resources. Yes, this may not be the most efficient response, but we need to invest to enable the communities who aspire to stay to be able to stay in place. So I think that's a a really interesting world of research and action that could receive more attention is the question of who's not moving, who's not moving as environmental and climate challenges become more severe. Sarah, before we close, how about you in terms of your vision of where you'd like to see the, the field go? I think the number one place where I'd like to see more investment in research would be in investing in understanding how to increase the efficiency of aid allocation for climate change. Because what we're seeing right now is the people on the front line, you know, you mentioned these are some of the most vulnerable people. They're also people. Foreign aid is not actually designed to work with people. It's designed to build hospitals. It's designed to build roads. It's designed to build schools. It's designed to have clinics that put shots into people's arms. And some of those things it does really well. It's not designed to reach quickly 500 million smallholder farmers on the front line of climate change. And how do we think about ways to innovate information sharing? How do we think about really involving local populations so we don't waste 10 years trying a technique that worked in one place somewhere else where it just is, there's no possibility that it's going to work. And it really is going to take the aid agencies investing in not impact evaluations. Sure, we need to do that. We need to know if we plant a new type of seed, does it work better? But we need to understand how to get information cascades going. We need to understand how to scale out what is being done in the international aid community, because there is no way we can reach all the smallholder farmers, all the small scale fisheries, that we can't reach that doing foreign assistance the way that it's being done right now. And those are the people who we really have to help if we want to be tackling the big injustices of climate change, but also the people who are more most likely to have their mobility affected in one way or another by climate change. Thank you so much, Sarah Bermeo and Carrie Lynn Shul, for joining us on this podcast. We really appreciate your insights, and I wish you both lots of luck in your continued research on this topics and lots of success in influencing the broader field at this nexus of climate adaptation and migration issues. Thank you. Thanks, Noam. Thanks for having us. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, 
The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 